the first lady becoming a political force behind Ronald Reagan's presidency. A new book, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan, explores her life and reveals new details about the couple's tumultuous time on Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm joined this morning by the biography's author, Karen Tumulty, a columnist with the Washington Post and soon to be deputy editor of their editorial page. Congratulations for that, Karen. Well deserved. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Look forward to talking about the book. I've read a cover to cover, but I've got some news of the day stuff I've got to hit with you first. The uh, CFO of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, and of course the Trump Organization itself indicted this past week. But it, it hit kind of with a thud, a lot of people think. It wasn't as big a deal as they thought. How nervous should the Trump family be that more is coming, or do you think it's no big deal? Well, of course, uh, they should be nervous. But yes, I think this, this indictment raises a lot of questions. Um, for one thing, there is no evidence of direct involvement of Donald Trump, nor was he indicted. Um, the, the Trump team is going to make the argument that this is typically the sort of thing that is the subject of civil proceedings, uh, tax evasion. It's usually handled by the IRS with an investigation. Uh, but the prosecutors keep saying they've got more, that there is more here. And, um, you know, I think that they are going to be under a lot of pressure to show what that is, because right now they really are, you know, given how politically charged this is going to be, they are going to be under a lot of criticism if they can't come up with much more of this, that this is really just politically motivated. Let's turn to the triumph of Nancy Reagan, your brand new book, uh, so well written. Uh, I was going to ask you why you decided to write it, but when you read the book, you learn it was your publisher that encouraged you. Why is five years after her death, which is all that is, um, the right time to take a look. Oftentimes historical figures, political figures, we wait about 20 years, so tell us historians, that we should wait. Well, but I think that, that sh you know, a lot of Americans sort of made up their minds about this very controversial first lady 40 years ago. And I really did, you know, I, I decided with this book I was going to follow the facts where they led me, and the facts turned out to be fascinating and also there was the issue of that a lot of the sort of key sources in all of this were uh you know people who are are getting on in the you know in years themselves yeah. so you know i was fortunately able to get to george schultz before he died um it, it, i did get the sense from a lot of the people James Baker, a lot of top Reagan administration officials that they, they, and members of the family even, that they sort of felt like these stories needed to be told now or they would never be told. I know you, uh, you write a lot about the kids as you should. It looks like Ron Jr. assisted you, but when it came to Patty, Michael, they had nothing to do with this, although you write, hey, I had their book, so I had something from them. Why the resistance? You know, I, I don't know. I, I certainly have to respect their decision not to talk to me, but it is true that both of them wrote extensive and very, very candid memoirs of their own that I was able to draw upon and really feel as though I did give them voice in my book. Uh, I talked to other members of the Reagan family as well. I talked to Dennis Revell, uh, who is the widower of Maureen Reagan, uh, President Reagan's eldest daughter yeah. who died a couple of decades ago. Um, I spoke to Nancy Reagan's stepbrother who also uh, died within the last few weeks. So I did feel like I could get sort of a full picture of this this very, very dysfunctional family. I think when history looks back on them, the AIDS crisis is one of the things that the Reagan presidency administration has some real trouble with. You actually, on page 415 for several pages, why I know that, I don't know, but you actually spent a lot of time talking about the, the fact that Nancy, who was friendly with Rock Hudson, she tried to get into President Reagan's ear and say, we need to do something about this, but he had people behind him saying it's a moral issue, and in fact, one advisor saying we should tattoo people who are HIV positive. He got it from both ends, but she didn't really win that, except I guess they did some effort. Yeah, and I think we need to stipulate here that the, the Reagan administration's handling of the AIDS crisis is and will always be a deep scar on its legacy. Uh, Nancy Reagan's involvement came probably too little too late, but I did unearth a lot of documentary evidence and talked to a number of people who were there. And, and got, I think, a 
a picture of what was going on internally in the Reagan White House at that time. And yes, she was very much trying to move her husband to the point where he could see this as a health crisis and not a moral crisis. But, you know, none of this really does excuse uh, anything that happened or more importantly, what didn't happen during the Reagan administration. And Dr. Fauci fans will find he was in the front row of that discussion as well. He's been around a long time. You write about Nancy Reagan as a powerful force in the White House, an important ally to have, but outside she was seen as icy, vain, and brimming with entitlement. That's not very positive. Which is the real Nancy Reagan more like? You know, she was so difficult to know, I think purposely. She didn't necessarily want people to know her that well. Um, I think, however, that her significance, her influence, her both on the rise of one of the most consequential figures of the 20th century, and also on the success of the Reagan presidency, uh, really has never been recognized and really should. Because when it came to her instincts about what was in her husband's best interest, she was almost always on the mark. The, the conundrum to me, though, was how somebody who could be so shrewd and, and so attuned and have such good radar about the people around her husband and the issues he was dealing with could then sometimes be so clueless about managing her own image. You know, like Reagan or not, I mean, there's various views about him. She was very strong. You write extensively about when he was shot. She ran to the hospital, and when they said, no, don't go, she's like, I'm going to walk there if I have to. She was very strong. She also had his ear. And, and of course, it's one of the great love stories of all time. You write so much about that. But when it came to things like Iran-Contra, we don't swear on TV. But he basically said, Nancy, shut up. This was a real marriage. I mean, they had their arguments. Um, but. But she really would push him uh, both in ways to protect him and I think in ways she had a very clear view of how she wanted him to be remembered in history. And, you know, I think people don't think of Nancy Reagan as, as being a major player in ending the Cold War, but it, it turns out she was. Well, it's a fascinating book. I wish we had more time just to go into it. It's, you, you've covered everything from beginning to end. The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. Uh, Karen, congratulations on this book. Congratulations on your promotion at the Washington Post. Uh, read you all the time, and I wish you well. Have a great 4th of July. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to take one more break. We'll be